Hey everybody, it's Francis Johnson and it's time for some coffee. A great break. I've got my favorite cup. Hopefully you'll grab yours and we can connect. Somebody emailed me and said, what are you drinking? And I said, I am drinking community coffee, community coffee. And in a real sense, I'm grateful for it. Hopefully Norman can join us uh, in a bit uh, and uh, we'll get started in just a moment. Uh, listening to some good coffee house jazz. Got a great talk. Uh, Want to talk to you about National Poetry Month and uh, about poetry that inspires me as well as introduce you to 23 poets I bet you have never heard of. Uh, as we celebrate and lift up the legacy of, uh, of particularly uh, black and brown poets um, in this National Poetry Month. I want to also uh, lift up a resource to encourage people during this time of COVID pandemic um, and confusion, misinformation, distraction, uh, delusions, if you will, um, and want to uh, dig deeper into a resource that I shared on Wednesday by uh, my good friend, Dr. Monica Coleman, not alone. I want to dig into a particular passage from that. Hopefully it will bless you. Why don't you share this video? Why don't you share this video? Uh, share this video. It may encourage someone on today. We'll be right back in just a moment. Just checked in with Norman and I think he'll be able to connect with us. If you want to connect with us, just put a comment in the line. I thought I saw uh, Amber. Rev, it's good to see you. Sabrina, good to see you. Rachel, good to see you as well. Come on in. Grab your cup. Somebody's drinking French vanilla. Yuck. Somebody's drinking community coffee with me. Isn't that great? Uh, and... Uh, no, I don't have my own brand of coffee. That's a great idea. Uh, and, uh, you know, my entrepreneur mind is moving. So why don't you grab you a cup and uh, and let's let's dig in. We mentioned earlier um, that uh, this is National Poetry Month. 
And we're grateful for all of the wonderful poets, Maya Angelou and Langston Hughes. You all know I named uh, my third child, uh, uh, our baby, Langston Hughes, Elijah Johnson. And so I love uh, the poetry of that period and love, uh, love poetry in general. This is National Poetry Month. And one of our resources uh, at uh, Magnolia and Mount Moriah is, uh, is found in cultural enrichment. And lots of folks uh, come uh, and are part of that faith community because of the cultural enrichment they receive. Well, we produced a list uh, of black, black Excellence, 25 Poets for Your Soul. You can go over to Magnolia and Mount Moriah uh, website. Uh, you'll find it off of the Facebook page um, and, uh, and take the test. See if you know these 23 poets. We're gonna dig into their poetry in just a moment. I'm grateful that Norman is able to jump into the uh, coffee house with us. Norman? How you doing, brother? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. We are grateful that you are able to join us. This is National Poetry Month, and uh, we've been talking about that from the top of the show this uh, today. Do you have a favorite poet? Well, I have quite a few. I, um, Langston Hughes is certainly one. Um, uh, um, uh, Maya Angelou is one of my uh, favorite poets, and um, Robert Frost, he's not African-American, but I certainly appreciate uh, his poetry as well. Um, I, I, I love poetry. Absolutely. Well, um, this is National Poetry Month. Another one of my favorite poets is Lucille Clifton. Every day something is trying to kill me, and every day it has it has failed. Uh, grateful for the poetry of Lucille Clifton and uh, and so many others. Why don't you put your favorite poet in the comment section, and uh, we're going to examine some poetry later on in the show. Um, your favorite poet, put it in the comment section. Indeed. Norman, how are you coping in the midst of all of this? How is business, first of all? Well, um, business is a little slow. And, you know, I, I, a great part of my practice is litigation. Courts are uh, basically uh, closed except for certain essential hearing matters. So all of my hearings have been canceled. Um, all of my depositions have been canceled, and I have to reschedule those. But, uh, you know, I do some music entertainment contract law. So I've been working on some contract stuff. I, I also have small businesses. So I've been doing some contract, particularly with one newly um, started small business. Uh, I do personal injury work, so I've been doing some with some files on that. Uh, adapting to this um, thing at home as much as possible thing, man, is, is definitely a, an adjustment. As you know, I, I'm out and about making things happen. Um, just like you. Well, I appreciate that. Now, how are you coping personally with this? I mean, what are you doing to sort of make sure that you are keeping um, your 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 mental health and emotional well-being centered in this space? Well, a couple of things. One, uh, I do make it practice to go to the house at least once a day, uh, walking and jogging in my uh, uh, just to get out to get that fresh air and that natural vitamin D. Certainly, not only helps me naturally breathe better, but it, it helps my my mind, my emotions. Um, another thing is, you know, I'm a, I'm a people person, so. Doing uh, activities like what we're doing, uh, connecting with people via social media, uh, has certainly helped uh, me to main to maintain contact and to satisfy that need uh, to be in contact with a person. Uh, as well. another thing is, uh, I'm a musician, man. So I got about 
15 guitars in the house. I got a piano in the house. And uh, music always makes things better. It just makes mm. life better. And I've shared some clips on social media. But uh, that's just a fraction of the music I've been making. Uh, wow. No, no, I, 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 I heard some of your clips. So you're moving from guitar to acoustics to piano to uh, keyboard. You just just all over the place. I, yeah, man. I, I I I've been doing this thing. It's a part of my um, healthy response to all of this craziness. Um, I've also been. You know, looking at scripture, and I did a Facebook live uh, message on last Saturday. Probably, probably we'll do another one tomorrow. Um, just being able to, uh, to put something positive out in the universe has been satisfying as well. Absolutely. You know, um, we were talking earlier this week in our devotion about ways to make sure that we. Uh, continue to put our mental and emotional mental health and emotional well-being um, uh, in its proper place uh, and to be centered in this space. And so um, things to look out for are uh, changes in in your eating and sleeping patterns. And that's that's hard to navigate when, you know, the set routines are disrupted. But uh, notice for those things, um, overconsumption of alcohol, Certainly, if you're abusing illicit drugs, those are things we want to stay away from. Um, making sure that we stay connected and we don't isolate ourselves, that you are part of a community, um, are, are really big and key. And just getting back to some of the basics, um, like uh, practicing good breathing uh, techniques when you feel overwhelmed, to simply close your eyes, center yourself again, and let it all go. Let it all go. All of the appointments, all of the things we thought were absolutely essential, the uh, things that we thought were non-negotiable, the dates that we thought that were certain, all of those things have just washed away. And so in a real sense, they can bring great anxiety at the same time, letting go and appreciating this is a season of letting go can be helpful too. And slowing down and taking some good breaths it's a good, good, good way to do that. Our breath is our anchor. Our breath is our place where we can always come back to the center and the beginning of things. Right. Uh, in the genesis of the story, we, we meet God giving us breath and we received that breath and became living beings. And so uh, being energized from that. Norman, I want to introduce a, a book. And I don't know if you know Monica Coleman personally. I've been lifting her up in prayer. Her mother transitioned um, a few weeks ago, and I, it's difficult at any time to lose a mother. Um, a mother uh, is, uh, at, for those of us who've had good mothers um, and who've experienced the joy of mothers, um, know that uh, it's a, a heartbreak that is uh, not like any other. So we've been lifting her up. This is a difficult time to experience that because you cannot have the full embrace of community. Folks reach out, they, they will try to connect in ways that they can uh, through prayer and through um, expressions of love and, and the like, but this is a difficult time. She writes in her book, Monica is a, a womanist theologian um, and uh, just a dynamic uh, thinker when it comes to faith matters. She writes in her book, um, not alone, and I've referenced this book and I've read from it often. It's a part of our um, yearly curriculum at Mount Moriah at Magnolia as we examine depression. Um, and this is generally a Lenten season uh, work, Norman. But she writes in the book about community on page 69 for those who, who, who have the text. Um, uh, you should, if you don't have it, you need it for your library. It's a great resource, especially during moments like this. Uh, but she writes about community and she references at the second chapter, verses 44 through verses 46. And, and I'm just going to read from that. And we can talk a little bit about that, Norman. It says, and all that believe, this is, this is when the church was at its best, when, 
when it was when it was uh, epitomizing community and all that believed were together and had all things in common and they sold their possessions and their goods and they parted them to all as everyone had need and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their food with gladness and singleness of heart. And she writes about the need uh, for community by uh, opening with Barbara Streisand's words, uh, people, people who need people are the luckiest people in the world. And of course, we all need people. We all need each other. The real question is, uh, in many of the places uh, that have been exposed by COVID-19 and this pandemic, it has exposed uh, the glaring gaps within our community, the glaring holes, the glaring, um, uh, you know, pitfalls, dungeons that people have fallen in, whole communities have fallen in, um, and, and these things are on full display. How do we build community? How do we build community after this, Norman? Well, I think one thing, and specifically reflecting on the scripture that you read from Acts, I think one thing is for us to take strategic efforts to uh, be discerning about what's common. Mm -hmm. In order to build community, there has to be a common element um, and we must find the, that common element even in the midst of uh, individualities and diverse gifts and talents and uh, different um, terms. There is a common element that we share that we must be discerning find because that common element is going to produce, uh, help to produce community. And I think the second thing is we must all have a willingness to make um, mutual sacrifice because it, it, the text clearly indicates they also, not some of them, they also, and I think that strongly suggests a mutual sacrifice that mm. we could up on which helped to build community. So those are two things I think that we would need. We would need to find a common element. We would need to be uh, willing uh, to make mutual sacrifice. You know, Norman, that's that's rich, uh, especially considering um, you know some of the current events and circumstances. For one, you you mentioned common element, and and oftentimes one of the great criticisms I've heard about uh, faith communities churches in particular, and um, conversations with, with folks who have a tradition, a family legacy in the black church, but have decided to walk away from it, is that those common elements were often guilt and, uh, and rope obedience. And these were elements that they, they just couldn't embrace any longer, that they didn't want to be a part of a community uh, that required them to feel guilty all the time about their humanity. Um, and they didn't want to be a part of a community that just required rope obedience to the mind at the door. I often say that if, if I could whisper into God's ears um, and offer an 11th commandment, I know that's presumptuous of me, it would be let my people think. Um, Thou shalt always think. <laughs> um, and so uh, these are elements that were a part of many faith communities and if there is to be a great coming back, uh, a, a great awakening, believing again, if you will, um, after this, they can't come back and they will not come back to communities that are built around guilt and rope obedience. Well, we, well, first of all, I think uh, those common elements you just uh, addressed were Oh, yeah. and, and feelings of inferiority, those were imposed elements uh, upon us as a people, which created a common characteristic among us. 
So I think that when we look at it in that light, we have responsibility to reject and redefine. Mm. And rejection and redefinition itself can create a new common element among us. We, we got to reject and we got to redefine and we must redefine our own reality and not live out uh, the reality that uh, imposes upon us and not accept uh, a common element that has been intended to uh, make us feel insufficient in area and all the other negatives that come along with that. Mm. Mm. So, so the the second part that you mentioned was sacrifice, and um, and, and Norman, I'm real concerned. You know, the the Congress appropriated 349 uh, billion dollars for small business owners, and today we hear reports. Um, you know, the president gets up and says that we're all in this together. The the, the officials in the administration have convinced. Um, the public that we need to appropriate $2 billion uh, of which 500 billion was directed towards big corporations to bail them out. And there was a set aside for $349 billion for small business owners. And in one week, this, uh, this fund has run out. And then we get the news that major uh, corporations and business interests have gobbled it up. Uh, and taking advantage of the loopholes within the laws, uh, skirted the spirit of that thing, uh, and not made uh, any effort to look out for the least and the most vulnerable, those businesses which are really at the core of the fabric of our communities, they've been shut out completely. And I anticipate that across the $2 trillion that has been appropriated, we're gonna find similar things against the one trillion dollars uh that the government has been putting in routinely every day since this pandemic began into the market we're going to find similar trends um is the word sacrifice just a, a word that is lost its meaning uh considering you know all that we are observing the lack of sacrifice of shared commitment uh, not just in regards to the 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 funding but the essential work at the moment the folks who are keeping the gas stations filled uh, with gasoline the grocery stores stocked who are taking care of folks in um, assistant living facilities who are the least paid in our society before we were arguing about whether they needed a living wage and now they become our essential workers let's not forget the undocumented americans who hide in the shadows but yet are feeding this country during the pandemic. Um, is the word sacrifice just a word that we just don't have real meaning of anymore? Well, I think, um, I think we may interpret it differently and based upon or dependent upon the interpretation of the word, um, um, the outcome of how we embrace the word um, is determined. I think when we look at scripture, we and, and I lift the word sacrifice from the scripture that was read. I, I would suggest that sacrifice meant um, a sacrifice as uh, of self as priority, a sacrifice of self as priority. That's why they were all able to agree to sell what they have and for the common good of the community. So um, in context with the statement you made, I believe if we apply that understanding of sacrifice or uh, aspect of sacrifice, sacrifice self as a priority, then we would be more inclined to see what are the issues that impact us negatively as a collective body. And how can I uh, uh, position myself uh, with the gifts and talents that I have to address those issues as a, um, a active player in the community uh, pushing for a common good. But in order for each individual to get to that point, we as a community 
must be willing to sacrifice self as a priority and understand that our destiny is intricately connected to the destiny of others. Um, so my best interest is somehow uh, connected with the best interest of the community. Um, one of the dangerous things I think happens is if any, any one individual becomes too satisfied with an accomplishment or too um, complacent in a position that he or she has achieved um, to the extent that we don't recognize that the battle it still exists and there is still need for a collective body to, to join forces with each other to continue to fight these major battles um, and not just be satisfied with a personal accomplishment or a uh, the reaching of a personal goal. So um, if we could understand sacrifice in terms of sacrifice of self, priority to the priority of the community, I think that alone would give us some um, advancement toward a uh, desired uh, end. Bring that in a real sense uh, with Johnson. We're with, still here. Yeah, we're, we're here. We're here, brother. Okay. Okay. I, I <laughs> talk to you for a second. <laughs> with with a. Uh, with that understanding of sacrifice, with that understanding of those common elements, sort of reforming our thinking around sacrifice, like you said, the privilege associated with it, and uh, rethinking about, uh, uh, rethinking the, the common elements of our experience within faith communities, within our profession, both of us are lawyers, uh, with colleagues, um, how do we, how do we make for a stronger community among those in our profession? Uh, how do we make for a stronger community for those of us who are actually neighbors? I mean, I live in a pretty tight knit community and I would, I would urge that uh, there are people who live on the very street with me that I don't know. Um, and that, that I really begin to think about that earnestly. How do we, how do we do that in terms of the common elements um, that, she, that Monica writes about. And of course, uh, this is all, and this is compounded uh, with, the, with the notion of depression, which is an isolation. Uh, it can be isolating. And in a real sense, um, I heard the president talk about um, a sort of an economic depression and ways to hedge off an economic depression. But in a real sense, dealing with the um, the real spiritual depression that we're in because of our lack of sacrifice, our uh, toxic common elements, uh, where we measure people's self-worth by their net worth, where we right. address people by uh, whether they uh, attended a certain school or might belong to our clique or our club or our group, uh, where we separate people by who they love and um, and how they choose to express that love uh, in their in their relationships. And, and in a real sense, those toxic elements have caused isolation. It's caused people to uh, to run from the fellowship rather than running towards the fellowship. And there is no community. So I'm grateful that I found a community um, and belong to so many communities and the wealth of that has been reflected in the ways that those communities are reaching out. Uh, during this time period, and that's a that's a blessing. I think one way to achieve that is when we um, join ourselves to smaller communities within communities. Um, I think it's helpful and would suggest that we don't um, just allow ourselves to be a part of smaller communities in communities in the circles where we are the experts. Mm. Uh, but um, we should allow ourselves to be a part of smaller communities within communities where we are 
the learner and not the teacher. And that things in perspective, uh, I think, uh, where, we, uh, where we allow ourselves the opportunity to realize mm-hmm. none of us what all, none of us has accomplished it all. We all still need each other. And it's a, it's a, there's a song that Hezekiah Walker uh, uh, sang, uh, like, 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 yeah, continues to sing, actually. Um, I need you, you need me. We are all a part of God's body. It is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. I, I think if we diversify our uh, involvement in areas that uh, we're not the expert in, um, it, it keeps things in perspective and it allows us to continue to recognize the need for community. Mm-hmm. Community is broader than my, my the, the circle uh, uh, that I I'm, I'm most comfortable in because I can master that circle. Ah, and that's associated with that privilege that that Monica writes about and that we've been you were discussing. Uh, and so, right. being a part of communities where we're not in the where we can participate as as learner, as student, right. um, and and have that shared understanding of giving and uh, receiving. That, that's right. beautiful. That's beautiful. That that that's exactly how I feel when I'm hanging out with you and your brothers. All of you all are so musically in, inclined. I mean, I can carry a preacher tune, um, a very poor one, <laughs> but but I can I can carry a preacher tune. But you all are just expert musicians, and I find such uh, such uh, richness in hanging out with you all in that space. It's something that that I'm not gifted in, uh, but it's something that um, I'm fascinated by watching you all do that. And I learn something uh, each and every time. And so I appreciate that. I think that, I think that's that's essential there. I think that's essential. And, and, and I can echo the sentiment. Um, certainly uh, in my, I don't know, 20 years of, of knowing you uh, or more, uh, I find it that uh, we been able to complement each other because there are many areas of strength you have that I found to be areas of weakness for me, and I was able to learn from you. Um, and I think that whole dynamic has helped the two of us develop a friendship um, and a partnership uh, that has been uncompromised. Uh, I think when we are either in a position where we are always giving, we can become number one arrogant and number two exhausted oh yeah on the other hand, if we're in a position where we are always a receiver uh, we can become beggars and loop number one become beggars and lose ambition uh, to become better and number two we can develop an inferior uh, complex of a mentality of always thinking that uh, others are better and no more but if we kind of find that balance where we are givers and receivers, where we are teaching and we are learning. It keeps us balanced and it keeps the way those enemies uh, to uh, a, a community that we often and too often see, I believe. So uh, I think our relationship is a great example of what helps to build a healthy community. And um, I think if we take some principles uh, that we've identified and share it and others uh, learn from it, I think we'd be better oh, at building the community. Norman, you better watch out. Watch out. Black man sharing affirmations for another black man. That, that That's that's revolutionary. <laughs> well, sometimes revolutionary is a progressive. You no, know, no, no. I fully appreciate it. Just know that, uh, that there's going to be comments, feedback, etc., because uh, one one brother is appreciating another, the feeling is I, I, I and I, <laughs> if I hang out with Lady Johnson, I'm a player. If I hang out with guys, I'm gay. If I'm by myself, <laughs> I'm, I'm stuck up. I, I'm kind of running out of category. So <laughs> I just want to be the best me that I can be. Amen. And know who I am, and can care less about those who misinterpret who I am because of that ignorance of knowing who I am. 
Ah, that's beautiful. That's that's beautiful, Norman. And the thing about that is, um, you know, when you when you when you uh, find that community and you can continue to build upon it. So I appreciate some of the folks, and I want to lift them up. Folks like John Drea, who's a musician who I met through you, um, who's now part of a ministry in Columbus, and um, and John Drea is part of a ministry in Orlando now. In Orlando, and I was going to get, the, and now in Orlando, coming full yeah. circle, coming full circle. My my understanding is that that he contracted COVID nineteen, and um, but has recovered. Um, and and is in that category of people who um, has fully recovered from it, and we give God praise and glory for that. But the rich. Yeah, let me also add. Uh, I don't even know if you're aware, but uh, my aunt and god sister Elaine Parks uh, contracted COVID nineteen, and she was hospitalized um, with it, and she got better. Um, and once she was in a position where she didn't have to have the, the ox oxygen mask, um, she was released to self quarantine herself to self quarantine, and with you know to follow doctor's instructions with the hope to continue to recover. I heard from her this week, I believe two days ago, that she has been cleared by the doctor that she's fully recovered and tested ne negative twice. So that's wow. another crazy. Wow, absolutely. I, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful to hear that. Grateful to hear that. Um, from we were talking a little bit about poetry earlier, and we've been doing a common read. It's a very simple read. So before people start sending comments about uh, the read, uh, we 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 we've, we've gone deep with Monica. We we at the shallow end with Oprah, but this is such a rich book, Norman. It's just little short vignettes pulled from uh, the old magazine, edited by Oprah, uh, where she writes what she knows to be sure, what she knows to be true, what she actually believes in. And she, she starts out with this notion that I, I didn't think that I had enough uh, wisdom to be able to write a column each month about what I the one thing that I knew to be sure. But she does, and she's put them together in this collection. It's a wonderful read. I've enjoyed it um, tremendously uh, because her life is fascinating. Someone who starts uh, at, I'm talking about at the bottom and uh, in terms of our society and is able to get to the places that she's able to get through, get to. And she does that by uh, looking inward and by um, excising her own demons and walking beyond her own fearful places, the valleys of her own shadows of, uh, of death, if you will, talking about the things that people think are unmentionable. Um, and so I'm just fascinated by her life. But in the area on all, she talks about the magic of poetry, the, the, the brilliance of poetry, to be able to do that. When we lost our second son, and you came and um, and and presided over the funeral service. And I say that with respect that lots of folks are not able to have memorial services. But back in back at that time when we lost uh Frederick Douglass, you came and uh and presided over the service and there was a po poem uh, on death by Khalil Gibran that was uh, include, included as a part of the program. And uh I, I go back to that poem so often. Um, and its words are so uh, feel so meaningful to me. And so let me just encourage folks, if you're sitting at home um, and you run out of Netflix, you run out <laughs> of shows on uh, uh, the various platforms, uh, Sling and, and Pluto, let me encourage you to pick up a book, get on the internet and search for uh, the 23 Poets. I'm going to post the link right now to this uh, great article on these 23 poets that you've never heard of. We've all heard of Langston Hughes and Maya Angelou, uh, but some poets that you've not heard of that you can strengthen your knowledge about black excellence. And of course, there are lots of poet, poet, poets that you can read that are um, that right from their, their, their experience that are not people of color, but uh, this is for the culture, if you will. So I'm gonna post that link 
and it's there for those who are following the comment section. Um, encourage you to take a look at it uh, and and uh, and be in with Norman. Um, yes, sir. Another another text and and our next coffee house chat. I want you to bring some of your texts that you that you find uh, rewarding um, and that you have leaned on during this period. Uh, but but you know books books are are important to me. And one book that I read every single day, it's uh, become tattered uh, in my use of it, is Common Prayer, A Liturgy for Ordinary Radicals. Let me see if I can get it up close. Okay. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. So um, this is um, sort of like a, a lectionary. Uh, and it's brilliant because it helps throughout the year to center uh, center me uh, every day um, in scripture and in reflection on people who serve and done uh, done done their work in their day, even as I'm seeking to do my work in mine. And this morning, uh, there was this section um, uh, in the in the prayer for others that I want to to read and live. It says. Lord, teach us to dwell in the corners and crevices, to find an abundance of your love in those pockets of our lives where the poverty of our abilities crowds out our pride and ego. Amen. Again, hey. let us dwell in those corners and crevices. For, for some reason, abundance of your love where our where poverty the poverty of our abilities crowds out our pride and ego and i think that echoes the sentiment that um that you were saying in terms of uh pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zones and outside those narrow confines of our own and experience life uh from the position of uh from a learner and there's much that we can learn in this space if we will do that. I thought that hey, Johnson, could you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, brother. Could you hear me, Johnson? Yes, sir. For some for some reason, I'm having technical difficulty. I can't hear anything that you're saying. Um, I, I don't know what's going on. I'm having some technical difficulties over here. I can hear you. I can't hear anything you're saying. <laughs> so if you're asking me a question, I, I if I don't respond, it's just because I can't hear you. Okay, brother. All right. So uh, check in time. Check in time. How are you doing out there? While we try to resolve Norman's technical difficulties, how are you doing out there? Hope you're doing well. Why don't you put a comment in the comment section and let me know how you're doing. Now, this, this is all designed as a way of trying to connect and stay connected one with another during this pandemic. And, and we want to know how you're doing. I want to lift up a couple of folks. I uh, want to lift up uh, Shirley Garrison. She's been in my heart uh, and mine today. Uh, she lost her brother. Uh, he uh, was a pastor in Pomona, California. And uh, I want to lift him up that whole uh, ministry that he was a leader of for the last uh, 20 years. I want to lift him up in prayer. He, his wife, his siblings, are all rooted in our home church. Um, I'm sorry, they might in the church that I one of the churches I pastor, Mount Moriah Baptist Church in Pembroke. Um, and we just want to lift up that family in the Magnolia Church family. I want to lift up uh, the family of uh, Marilyn Carter Hayes, mother of. Uh, 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 Sylvia Hay, uh, Hayes Trimble, as well as uh, Trimble family, they're in they're in grief this, today as loss of their mother, um, and so just want to lift those folks up. I know there are folks all over who are experiencing loss, and why don't you, if you want to remember them, post their their names in the comment section. Uh, we're going to light a candle uh, as we do each day um, in reflection, uh, and um, and certainly remember them in our prayers. How are you doing? How are you doing out there? Uh, let us know how you're doing. Zambia, thank you for commenting. She says that she's downloaded Oprah Winfrey's book on Audible. Isn't it beautiful? 
hearing uh, those words from uh, Oprah, her voice, uh, sharing her understandings. Um, in this moment, how are you coping? How are you coping with COVID-19? How are you coping with COVID-19? One of the ways I am coping is taking breaks between work and Zoom calls here, there, conference calls, uh, trying to get different things out. This is, this is what I'm doing on this Friday uh, to make sure that I stay centered. I'm stopping, I'm pausing, because um, I found that working from home, I'm busier uh, than I've ever been. Um, and so um, I'm stopping to finish my cup of coffee and to talk with you today, uh, as well as uh, connect with Norman, my good friend, uh, who is down in Tampa, Florida, doing the same thing, trying to run a law practice, trying to sustain ministry. Um, and uh, he's a musician, uh, whereas I'm an educator and we're both trying to maintain. Um, and so uh, what are you doing to, to do that? What are you doing to do that? I'm trying to resist going to the refrigerator. Uh, I'm trying to resist. I'm trying to resist it. I'm fighting hard, <laughs> trying to resist overconsumption of alcohol, trying to resist how you coping with COVID-19, trying to uh, remember some of those old habits that, uh, that were so enriching in my life uh, before I got so busy with the ways of living uh, that, I, that I like reading, uh, like taking enough time to meditate, taking enough time to just rest and relax, um, taking enough time to think about others and to, uh, to be intentional about all of those things. So how are you coping with COVID-19? How are you coping with COVID-19? Lots of folks have written in and said they want to know where their check is. Where's my check? Where's my check? I get it. Understanding uh, the stimulus. Uh, for what it is, is something that is a big concern. You know, we've been working real hard with our nonprofits that we represent, as well as the churches uh, that we're privileged to work with um, as council to try to get as many of them included in the uh, stimulus relief that was provided to nonprofits and to churches, um, as well as the other small businesses that we represent as well. And so, um, Unfortunately, uh, what we anticipated came to pass and lots of folks uh, for whom this program was not intended gobbled up a lot of the resources. And I think you're gonna be shocked um, and disgusted when the full list comes out. And so um, just want you to know that this is an ongoing concern and we we'll continue to dig into this. But for those of you who haven't applied, you should go ahead and apply. You should go to sba.gov and apply for um, the COVID grant up to $10,000. Uh, if you have employees, they will give you $1,000 per employee. Um, and if that program has run out of funds, then there's, they're already planning the next stimulus. And uh, we're already advocating for more relief for small business owners. Uh, the, those, are your, those are mom and pop stores, barbers, cosmetologists. Uh, people who have uh, private transportation companies, uh, people who are, are independent contractors, uh, tutors, uh, babysitters, um, those who uh, do private nurse care, uh, anyone, uh, these grants are available to you. They gave the widest definition possible uh, uh, to include as many people as possible. And unfortunately, we hear that Ruth Crisp and other huge, uh, you know, multi-state um, in national companies have gobbled up a lot of the resources. So we're going to advocate. We are doing it already uh, through all the organizations that we're a part of and through the ones that we lead for there to be um, directed, targeted stimulus that's restricted to, to the truly small business owners. And to do that by connecting with institutions that service them. Uh, our, our, our black savings and loans institutions, um, as well as banks, uh, that they should have some targeted resources to get deeper um, into our community, uh, as well as uh, thinking outside of the box and using other, other targeted 
uh, mechanisms by which small businesses are transacting business like Cash App and PayPal uh, and some of these other uh, fintech uh, 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 resources that small businesses have used uh, to, to do the business they needed to do, uh, that we need to have some of that stimulus targeted in that direction. For those of you who've gotten your um, individual stimulus, God bless you. God bless you. Favored are you <laughs> for the rest of for the rest who are just uh, checking their account every day, I get it, I get it, I get it. Um, let me encourage you to know that, um, you know, to be wise, be wise, be wise, be wise. We include every month um, a financial resource uh, tool and or tip um, uh, for those at Magnolia and Mount Moriah to be able to effectively manage their resources. Uh, because it's not what you make at the end of the day is what you can keep. Um, it is uh, uh, those resources are given to bless uh, the world, um, the portion of the world that 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 you are called uh, to to attend to and manage. And so um, and so let's not give it all to you can do whatever you want with it is yours. You, you've you endured this this pandemic and this crisis is like the rest of us. And I'm not a part of any shaming movement as to what people do with their money. I mean, it was your money uh, before anyway, uh, that the, the government had. And so it's your money, do whatever you want with it. <laughs> but at the same time, be wise. I, I think this is, um, this is going to be a longer endeavor than any of us anticipated. Uh, and we see the national leadership that we have. Many of our state leadership is in a similar situation of delusion and denial. So uh, just know that um, that uh, surely all of our help does come from the Lord. Be wise with that help that you already have, already have. Have you got your check? Have you got your stimulus? Um, somebody said that stimulus is stimulate. That's too funny. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Make sure that in this moment that you do a couple of things. Um, you got the time, do it. Uh, fill out the census. If you haven't already done that, fill out the census questionnaire uh, because the census will inform um, uh, the um, apportionment process by which the Congress will be reseated. Um, and that's pretty important because the Congress uh, is the lawmaking body for the United States. It will also determine Every General Assembly, City Council, County Commission, Board of Education, Water Commission, every single uh, authority in this country is set up um, uh, uh, on the idea of uh, equal representation. One man, one vote. That's a pretty important precedent in the law. And that's all rooted and connected to the census and making sure your community is fairly is, is counted accurately is important. We want to we want an accurate count so that power can be distributed more fairly. So um, uh, do that. Secondly, if you are not registered to vote, get registered, get registered today. Um, uh, all you got to do is on your browser, just uh, just type in vote. It will take you to a place uh, 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 where you can vote, uh, register to vote, vote.gov. Uh, you can go to your secretary of state's website and register to vote. Um, as chairman of the New Georgia Project, my sole function is to support the New Georgia Project and its staff in seeking to close the gap between the under uh, underrepresented and those who are traditionally suppressed. Uh, and because we know that elections have consequences. So we want to checkmate those folks who believe that uh, the government is their piggy bank to be bailed out. Uh, they don't believe in socialism except when it comes to bailing out their companies and corporations. And so um, socialism is good for them, but not good for the rest of us. Uh, COVID-19 has exposed some of that. So checkmate elections have consequences. They have consequences. I um, uh, want to wanna close as we wrap up and uh, go back, let you go back to your your evening. I'm going back to work. Um, uh, I want to close in prayer. People have requested prayer and I'm grateful for it. 
um, praying for those who are on the front lines, who are on the front lines, who were recruited into uh, this this war against COVID-19. Um, and some of you were constricted into it. So while people tell you, thank you for being essential workers, in a real sense, I know lots of folks, people who are members of our church who have to go to work. They don't have a choice. They've asked to be off of work. Uh, they have compromised immune systems. They have struggles uh, because their children are home. They have uh, worries because uh, uh, just how dangerous their working environment really is and how exposed they are and the lack of protective equipment that they're given uh, to protect themselves. Um, and they're concerned. And so they, they are not essential workers by choice. And our cheap thank you is of little, little regard uh, in terms of their safety and well-being. It's, it's, it's like Bonhoeffer's cheap grace, if you will. And so I just want to acknowledge those folks who are struggling in the midst of all of this right now. If you are sheltering and you're in place, if you are home, you are privileged. We are, I am privileged to be able to be on this, this Facebook Live. Um, and I recognize that. I want to acknowledge those who, uh, who are not able to shelter in place, cannot shelter in place, and are struggling tremendously. And it seems as if all this country has to offer them is uh, a cheap thank you. No offer to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, no offer to expand Medicaid 50 states wide and all the territories, no uh, to ensure that uh, health care is a universal right, no, 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 no real talk to, to engage in a true year of jubilee, uh, debt forgiveness, debt forgiveness uh, is critical. Um, and, um, and I think that's a conversation that we need to talk about, whether it's student loan debt, or whether that is uh, uh, other forms of debt. I mean, we bailed out the banks 10 years ago. Maybe the banks can bail us out now. <laughs> um, but these are things that I'm concerned of praying for, praying for, praying for earnestly, praying for those who have been so personally impacted by this. The more than uh, 25,000 Americans who've perished, people around the world who've perished uh, from COVID-19, uh, hundreds of thousands of people who have um, contracted this and uh, have suffered, those who have recovered, those who are working uh, to take care of the sick and the afflicted, praying for them as well. Uh, praying for all of you who have uh, temporal things. Uh, we say these things can be replaced, but people who have worked hard and watched uh, for no fault of their own, the rug literally be snatched from under them. Just praying for you and your peace of mind um, in the midst of this, uh, praying for families, praying for those who are experiencing um, being sheltered in place with, in dangerous environments where it doesn't feel like family, praying for the young girl who uh, who is in week four of having to shelter in place with the very person who's a predator coming into her bedroom at night, uh, praying for the for the young man who is struggling uh, because way too many responsibilities are being heaped on his shoulders at too young of an age, taking care of his other siblings while his parents go out and do their essential functions. Just praying for folk that the difficult circumstances that people are really in. And uh, I wish that our president would spend some time in his press conferences each day thinking about the Americans who don't get the privilege to live in the White House, who don't have Secret Service protection, who can't get tested whenever they demand a test, and who are struggling because they don't have government-sponsored health care like he does, um, and the best doctors uh, in the world. Um, so just, uh, just praying for our community and our family. This has been uh, coffee break. Coffee break. I finished my cup. So we're done for today. Leave me a comment. Let me know uh, how you're doing, how you're feeling. I uh, want to thank and praise God for those who uh, have uh, have been on today and, and shared. Thank you so much. Uh, Pastor Smith, I'm following your lead. Thank you for your, for your tip earlier. God bless you all until we are able uh, to share again. I want to conclude with this prayer from 
Uh, again, the common prayer, liturgy for ordinary radicals. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. And may he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storms, bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that has been shown to you. Bring you home rejoicing once again to your own door, to our door again as we build today. God bless you. Take care. We'll see you. We'll see you soon.